Good morning, folks. This is Todd Colburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 10 of Arrow 4080. Today we're going to be looking more at modeling beams and we're going to look at the different kinds of elements that can be used. This is going to lead us into a better understanding of just how challenging it can be to interpret results if we're not very careful with the elements that we use. Let's see how it works. So if we take a look at a deep beam, this beam is uh, 10 inches long by 10 inches tall. And if we look at that solution, let's say it's a lumped beam. Let's say we take this I beam and we lump its properties with our two areas and a shear panel. And if that idealization is appropriate, then we can calculate our section properties like this. And if we go and we look at our deflection for that beam, if we account for only bending or the normal stresses in the beam, we get this kind of deflection. This is what most folks in industry would report as the deflection of a beam like this because they would just go to a little simple formula like the ones in your handbook in the appendix. They would plug in the data, the length and the area and the eye, excuse me, the length and the eye and the force and all that, and they would calculate a deflection like this, 0.006 two inches of deflection. Now, if we were to account for the sheer flexibility of this beam, which is normally neglected, we would get a uh, the sheer flexibility alone, just this beam moving as a sheer panel, gives us 0.01224 inches of deflection if our shear factor is one. And what this says is this thing has, because this beam is so short relative to its depth, it is actually going to deflect about twice as much in shear as it does in bending. What this implies is that the mm, calculation, the number, the deflection that most folks would calculate that ignore the shear deflection completely misses the boat for a deep beam like this when a beam is about as deep as it is wide. Okay. But that's our, uh, that's our analysis, and we get a different number if we plug in a little different factor. Okay, now with that said, the total deflection then would be adding your bending deflection and your shear deflection. So the total deflection is actually more like about point, uh, shown right here. Our total deflection would be about 0.018 uh, or 0.0194, depending on... Uh, what kind of shear effectivity we're assuming. Our stresses are calculated pretty simply, like this MC over I, and the average shear stress, 5,000 over the area. Okay? So uh, if we were to then draw an exploded free body diagram of the thing, we would look at each node and each element, and we would get that our shear flow is just that force 5,000 over the depth of beam. Our force in the, in the rod should be 5,000 at one end and zero at the other end, and so on. This would be our exploded free body diagram. Now let's go ahead, and now that we've done this kind of solution, so this is a pretty standard solution. Normally, like I said, we'd be ignoring the shear deflection part, which would mean it's completely wrong deflection for this case. Our force is going to be calculated with this simple uh, lumped area uh, number, no problem, and our exploded free body diagram would look like this. Now, if we go then and try and model this beam, let's take a look at how that works. Let's start by just modeling this beam with a single bar element, the C-bar element, going from node 1, where it's fixed, to node 2. If we were to model like this, uh, we would put in our properties of the thing like this. This would be our little finite element model. We've got two grid points. We've got one bar element with a property and a material and an SBC for the left end, and a force at the right end. And if we only accounted for the shear flexibility by only having the P bar card as we see here, then we would get a deflection which actually matches perfectly our solution. Okay? And this would be the kind of output. You'll notice here, if we do this kind of model, we get a deflection which perfectly matches the bending solution. Now remember, our hand, our theoretical solution, the bending solution, was wrong. 
It was correct for the normal stresses in the beam, but since it neglected shear deflection, and this beam has a more dominant shear deflection than the normal stress deflection, so this is just as wrong as the hand analysis, but it perfectly matches the hand analysis, which is kind of a good thing. We see that when we look at our single point constraint, we can see exactly what the reactions are. We can see the reacting moment and the reacting shear at the left end. We also can easily determine the bar forces, and we can take the shear force and the moment and the axial load, and we can analyze P over A plus or minus MC over I, and do a VQ over IT kind of shear analysis. So this, while it's extremely simple and it kind of neglects all that depth of the beam, it handles it quite easily and it's very easy to interpret, even though we have a known error in our solution. Now the forces and moments in our solution would be correct, but our deflection is off because it, it, it neglected that shear deflection, but it's exactly going to match the, uh, the deflection that you would calculate normally. Now, if this beam had the same eye, but was actually uh, much shallower in depth, then this would be a, eventually be a correct solution. Like if this was like one inch deep or less, then probably this deflection would be correct. But because the beam is so deep, that shear deflection dominates. See that? Okay. Now, with that said, if we were to go and uh, draw a free body diagram, we could explode our little model. We'll take node 1, node 2, and put our element 1 between them and put our reactions from our output, our Nastrin output, and our internal forces from our out output. We can see easily, it's easy to see what all the forces are within the, element, in, within the model as well as external to the model. Now, if we were to account for the shear flexibility, Remember, we do that by putting a third line in our P-bar card and putting in a little indicator there, as we can see here. Remembering our theoretical solution, we see that that actually uh, gives us uh, basically exactly the right number. So what we find here is a bar element. If we ignore shear flexibility, then we match perfectly the theoretical solution. And if we include shear fixed flexibility, we perfectly match the theoretical solution. If the theoretical solution ignores shear flexibility and our model does the same, our numbers, our model will perfectly represent the assumptions we used. If we include shear flexibility in both our hand analysis and our finite element analysis, then once again we find this perfectly matches for deflections as well as for the forces within the element and it's quite easy to use those forces. This is one of the reasons why a C-bar element is so effective. Now, because the C-bar element is like in a line element, then whatever properties, assuming those properties are right there at the middle of that, although you can use an offset to slightly tweak your numbers a little, make them a little better or a little worse, depending on your knowledge and the way you apply it, we find that the C-bar does a pretty good job of not only get getting internal forces that we can use and analyze easily. It also does a pretty good job of deflections. Okay? All right. Now let's look at the next element. Let's go ahead and use a shear element, a C shear element. Okay? If we use a shear C shear element because of the deep beam, this is an effective way of doing this. We can we would then use usually rods on either side. We can use bars, but why have the bending? Because we can assume that the rod is just carrying axial load, like our typical uh, lumped area assumption. So we're using our lumped area assumption. We assume that the rods carry all normal stresses, and the the panel carries just shear stresses. Okay. So with a C shear element, you can see we have two bars here, and we have a single shear panel. Actually, we have three bars because we have one on the right end as well. Our model might look like this. Now we're going to look at two different ways of modeling this with shear panels. Because when we use that shear panel model, remember we have that ability in our P-shear card to call out whether we want to use like 30T of effective widths or like full effective widths or what, okay? And that's all in the P-shear card. If you look at the P-shear card here, you see that we've got our F equals to 1, which is the 6th and 7th field, I believe, of the P-shear card. And because that's true, then this imposes what 
Nashtran manuals call full effective widths. Now this is a little confusing because it sounds like the full of, uh, width is is valid in axial load. And that's kind of true, but not completely true, okay? So we'll see how that works. So we're gonna we can model it with a full effective width by putting in an f equals one on our f1 and f2 equals one on our p shear card. Or if we wanted to use, let's say, remember thinking back to arrow 3271 when we learned about effective widths and we learned about in compression. A lot of times only part of the web is effective. So if we wanted to use a, a 30T kind of effective width, meaning we've, we're putting 30T of our, of our panel into the stringer, then we would uh, have the exact same model except our P shear card would look like this, where instead of putting a 1 in for our F parameter in field 6 and 7, we put in a 30 parameter, which notifies Nastran you want to use not full effective widths, but 30T. Okay? All right. Now, if we did that, uh, we would get results like this. Okay? And we would get, if we use F equals 30, we're going to get a deflection of about 0.0323. And if we use f equals 1, we're going to get a reflection of 0.0313. So they're nearly the same number. These two methods come up with a similar estimate, and both estimates are off, right? Remember, our theoretical solution was this, 0.0194. What this means is, right, when you account for the shear deflection, what this means is that this overpredicts deflection by a factor of about 1.6. So if we had modeled this with a bar element, not only would we have had internal forces that are easy to read and understand, which means forces and moments, we would also have a deflection which is accurate. We can either include shear effects or not and nail the theoretical solution. As soon as we use a shear element, which looks like a better element because it accounts for the shape, uh, the depth of the beam theoretically better, we're going to find out that not only the results harder to use, but the deflection is now completely wrong. Hmm. Now, a lot of times we don't need the exact deflection. But remember, since this is the deflection method, then the deflection does affect results. <coughs> so, so what I said we're going to have more trouble def uh, delumping our properties, but actually there, in some ways this is easier to use the results, in some ways it's hard to use the results. Let's take a look at how that works. Okay, so but the first thing we're going to note is a C-share element, which looks like it's a better element to account for the depth of the beam, gives us a deflection that's wrong. Okay, all right. All right. So, uh, oh, before we move on, Remember, we've got two ways of modeling this. One is using F1 equals 1, which it gives us like full effective widths. And the other one, which gives us a 30T. Now, in this particular beam, because there's only a web on one side of the rod, if 30T is the total effective width, we're only getting 50T of effective width in our element. Okay? So with that, all right. All right, so let's take a look at if we had used that 30T model, then let's look at our results. This would be our results. We can see our displacements. Once again, the deflection in the y direction based on the coordinate system I used here is the max deflection is 0.0313 as we saw before. These are our single point constraints. It's easy to verify that our left end forces are correct. These are our forces in our rod elements. Now our rod elements, this looks wrong because if we draw a free body diagram like we did before, we saw like element three or excuse me, element two, should be zero on the one end where the force is applied, and it should be maximum. And what that force is would just be that 5,000 times 10 is your moment divided by the 10 depth, which gives you the force, which should be 5,000. So our single point constraint forces are correct, but our forces in the element look really fishy. They look wrong, okay? Now, the reason they look wrong is because you have to de-lump your model. So we used a what looked like a better model, a more complicated model, but now we have to de-lump it to even understand what these forces and the elements mean. Stick with me. We also have our quad or our C shear element and our force in our C shear element, we find we got these values. Uh, the shear along edge one to two is 500 minus 500 pounds per inch. 
the shear along uh, edge 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1, because a C shear element, a shear has to be the same in both directions. That means all forces are the same. Shear flow, which is 500 pounds per inch. Can you see that? Okay. So what this means is if we then uh, show our results here, we're going to see we have that 500 pounds per inch here on our quad element, element 10. We see that we have 2326 in the rod. Now that actually is the average force in the rod. It's the force at the middle. Okay? So what that means is we're going to have to de-lump it. So we get these values and they don't seem to match. If we look at this, they don't seem to balance anymore. So we're going to look at that on the next slide and see how that balances, okay? Recalling our theoretical displacement. And this is our modeling differences once again. And these results are all for that 30T model. Look at the full effective width, the F equals 1 model in a bit, okay? All right. Now, if we go and we look at our NASTRAN, what NASTRAN reports, we see it looks like NASTRAN reports this right here that we've drawn to the left, and we're focused only on the upper part of the model, okay? It reports the average C rod force and the running C shear force, okay? So how do we do this? Let's take a look. This is what Nastran is actually doing. What's it going to do? If we take a look at our real model and we draw that out here, what we see here is we've got that panel which has shear flow on it. So there's a shear flow on the panel and there's a shear flow that it reacts against the rod. And then you'll see this, there's this imaginary rod that it creates when you use that 30 value for F. And what that's going to do is going to give us a rod with a certain area, and that area is going to be 15T on each side of the stringer, 30T total. In this case, since there's only a web on one side of the stringer, it's only got 15T in there, okay? So we see if we draw a free, an exploded free body diagram, our rod 2 goes from element 4 to element 3, and we also have this imaginary rod which comes from our C shear element, and then we have the C shear element itself, and all these have forces, okay? We have the force on the rod itself, that's the value that was echoed in the Nastran output, and we also have a hidden rod, a force in this, this C shear element, and it's acting like a rod there that's not seen, okay? What we would have to do if we say, okay, the force in the rod is the area in the rod over the total area times the total force. We then can rearrange that and say the total force then is the total area divided by the area of the rod times the P in the rod, which is what Nastern reports. And therefore, we could say, well, the, rod, the force in the shear element or that imaginary shear rod can be given by this equation. Therefore, we can write it this way, which gives us this value. Therefore, the total rod force is actually the value of the shear panel, which we can't see quite as easily, plus the force in the rod itself. We'll look at this further on the next slide. Okay? And this is just reminding us of our differences in modeling again. All right. So let's take a look at the next slide. Here now, what we're doing, we're saying Nastran computes these values. This is what we have. And we said that the shear, the force in the shear element is just this area of the shear element divided by the area of the rod. Now, the area of the shear element, remember, we put in 30 for our F1 and F2. That means we have 15T for each web. We have one web attached to this panel, which means we've got 15T is the width times the thickness, which is the area. That's the area of the imaginary rod divided by the area of the rod that we put in, which was a half inch, times whatever force Nastron reports, the force in the rod, okay? This, once again, is for the seashore element with 30T of skin. That gives us this, this much force in our particular model. Now, if we want the total force, we're going to have to add that to what Nastron reports to get the total force, which is 2,500. This is at the center of the rod, right in the middle, not at either end. Okay, this is the central force. Okay. With that said, then, if we want to look at our element, we see we break our element now in half. We see this PT occurs at the centroid or the middle of that rod. 
and we see that element 1, which we've broken in half, we see we have a shear flow, which is our shear from 3 to 4. Okay? We also are showing our two upper nodes. All right? So if we want to calculate the real force in the rod at node 4, we would need the force uh, the force from the rod, right, plus or minus whatever is coming from the panel. So if you say, okay, we just calculated the force at the middle of the rod is PT, then on the right end, which is right at the middle, we have PT in the rod, and then we have, acting with it, the shear from 3 to 4. That's 500 pounds per inch times the length, since the total rod is 10 inches long, the length that is applied to that half of the rod is 5 inches then, and we see that the, the shear panel carries, it looks like uh, 2,500 pounds, the rod carries 2,500 pounds, therefore the total rod force is 5,000. If we want to see the, node, the force at node 3, we do the same thing, but now we find the shear flow is acting against the internal force in the rod that we have in the C rod element, and that gives us at the right end. So what we see now is the left end of the rod is at 5,000, the right end is at 0, and that gives us something that perfectly matches. So this is what we have, and that gives us a shear, an exploded free body diagram that completely balances. Once again, this is for using F1 and F2 equals 30, okay, which imposes a 30T. So, to kind of summarize, if we use F1 and F2 equals 30, that's going to give us 30T of effective width of skin. The effect of that will be Nastern will imagine a rod with an area equal to 30t of skin, which is 30 times the thickness, times the thickness is the total area. And if we want to know how much force, like let's say that this is a cap, we have the cap of the beam and we want to analyze that, and we also have a little bit of a web attached, and we're trying to analyze that combination, we would need to add these together and get the total end force. 5,000 pounds, not 2,500 pounds, and not 23, 25 pounds. Okay? All right. Now, if we print out our grid force point balance, uh, grid point force balance, it actually can help us. You'll notice that when we do that for this particular element, we're going to get a balance at each and every node. So at node 1, we find out the forces going into node 1. That's the lower left, uh, lower left grid point, right? We have a rod force, we have a shear, a force from the shear panel, and we have a force from the SPC. If we add those together, they are summed to zero. And you'll notice 9 times 10 to the minus 13 is zero for all intents and purposes with just a little round off from the mathematics, okay? And so on for all the other elements. All right, so let's take a look. If we had instead modeled this C shear panel, with F equals 1. F1 equals 1 and F2 equals 1. If we do that, we're going to get these results. We get almost the same deflection, so it doesn't make a huge amount of difference in the deflection. We're going to get the same single point constraints, but actually we'll see that our rod, axial rod forces, look different. Our C shears look the same, the same force in our C shear elements. You see that? Okay. Now with that said, we then come here if we do the same thing we did before with our little free body diagram, now what this does is, now Nastran's handbook is a little confusing because it says that it gives full effective width. But it doesn't seem to actually lump any area into the rod. You can actually imagine this is just like a rod in a shear panel now. So the, the force in the rod that Nastran reports is the central force, the, the force at the center, so it's 2,500 pounds already, which means there's no real area in that imaginary rod. Okay, so it's 2,500 pounds at the middle. That means that in the middle, we have just 2,500 pounds, just like it reports. Now to get the endpoint forces, we then are going to have to draw a free body diagram as we do here. 
We have our PT, which is 2,500, same as before. It's just last time with the 30T idealization, we had some of it in our 30T imaginary rod and some of it in the rod itself. Now we have all of it in the rod itself, and there's no real imaginary rod. But we still have this running load along the, the that element, which means we have that shear from 3 to 4, which is 500 pounds per inch. So if we want to know the force at the left end. If we sum the forces, we're going to find that we would have that 2,500 pounds plus 500 times 5, which gives us our 5,000 pounds at node 4. And if we do the same thing at node 3, we find out that our force at zero is 0 over there, and we get the same kind of free body diagram. You'll notice there's only a couple differences here in the way Nash Turner reports the results. Okay? So that's how we use C shears. So with this said, you'll notice it's probably a little easier to use that F equals one parameter and put whatever area you need in the rod in the rod and allow that shear panel to just carry shear. It's like the shear panel carries no axial force at all in that particular case, okay? So let's take a look at our grid point force balance. That looks like this. And once again, you'll notice that's actually a little easier to debug. So it looks like using not getting too fancy with the model and just using a simple F equals 1 is a little easier to interpret because we don't have to do all that delumping of forces in the rod. So all we have to do is account for the rod and account for whatever shear flow is in our panel. See that? Okay. Our next idealization is to make a deep beam model, but instead of using a C shear, let's use a quad element, or a membrane element, okay? So our model would look the same. We still have four grid points and one panel. We still have three rods going around the thing. And our final model looks like this. It's nearly identical to the last one, only now we have a C quad and a P shell rather than the C shear and the P shear. Okay? You'll notice the displacement is 032, so it's just about as wrong as the shear panel. So whether we use a quad element or a C shear element, our deflections are wrong. They're off by a factor of two or something almost, or one and a half, 1.6 or something, okay? Actually, here's the deal, 1.64 times. So basically, while we may think, a lot of folks think that modeling with quad elements gives a better result, and they have all these auto-meshed models with all these tiny little quad elements, but actually it doesn't necessarily give you a better answer. It just gives you an easier model to make and a harder one to interpret for a lot of intents and purposes, okay? So let's see how that de-lumps, de okay? If we look at the results, uh, we're going to first find that we get a grid point singularity table. If we don't do an auto SPC that removes, that purges all degrees of freedom that are superfluous, that aren't restrained properly, then we're going to find out this says, hey, look, we've got stiffness problems with uh, uh, in at node 2 in the 3 direction, right? That's out of plane because there's nothing, no stiffness out of plane and about the 6, which is our rotation element, about the uh, uh, Z, so the rotation about the Z also. So we see we have some singularities that actually doesn't influence our result in this particular case. We have to kind of think those through and make sure it's not going to be an issue. We see our displacements look like this. Once again, we already reported the displacement as 0.032, which we saw was wrong by a factor of 1.6. We get our single point constraint forces. Those look correct. We get our forces in the rod elements. Now, those look even wackier than they did for the C shear. Okay? That's an actual force at the centroid or at the middle of that rod. So it's not the force at either end. It's the average force or the force at the middle. So we're going to have to adjust that to get the force in the rod at either end based on the quad element. Okay? And then for the quad, instead of getting a single shear flow, which is rather easy, we're going to see we get a running load along the, in the x direction at each node, a running load in the y direction at each node, and a shear flow along each edge. You'll see that shear flow is shown as fxy. All these are running loads, pounds per inch. So the bigger the panel is, the more actual force there is for the same running load. Okay. And you'll see there's no transverse forces and no moments on the element because we gave this no moment uh, stiffness. We didn't put in a 1 for bending stiffness out of plane. There was no load out of plane, so it still would have been 0. But 
So if we draw our free body diagram and delump all our inputs, this is the kind of free body diagram, the exploded free body diagram that we would get. Now you'll notice this is very challenging to delump. We see that, and this is not a complete free body diagram because you'll notice we didn't put the end forces on the rod. It's much harder to delump. Okay? So you see we've got running loads at each node on each panel. We've got running loads in shear on the panel. And then we have the rods, which we have to delump. It's very challenging to pull results out of this kind of model and do anything other than just look at the pretty picture and report what the stress it thinks it is. The problem is, if you remember back to 3271, that a lot of times just the stress itself is not sufficient because the stress is fine if we're talking like a thin element where the principal stress is what we're comparing to FTU. It's not that meaningful if we have anything in compression. Now we need to be able to calculate the Euler and the Euler-Johnson and the crippling allowables of that material in order to determine whether it fails or not. If we do a grid point force balance, we're going to get this. We find out we have at each node, we have the quad, we have the rod, and we have the SPC forces. What this does, we take a look at how this works. We see that it does indeed sum up to zero based on all those elements coming in. However, it can be very challenging to deal with that ourselves when we start talking about quad and higher elements. Okay. Now, if we were going to model the fuselage, this is a little excerpt from a modeling study I back, did back in the early 90s when I was a young buck. This is a little, so I uh, was looking at a fuselage, which is a frame with a floor. And the first thing I did was compare a cylinder or a, just a circular ring solution using the different modeling techniques. And then I looked at a ring with a floor and looking at the different modeling techniques and I drew some conclusions. This is one quarter of that circle model when we model those with bar elements. And this is how we would delump those. This is when we use two C quads for a quarter ring. And this is how we delump that. You'll notice, look at all the extra output you now have to delump. While this modeling technique allows us to actually model the depth of the beam in a more uh, seemingly accurate way, it provides a lot of additional output, which can be challenging to delump. And if we were to use three C quads, which means one outside and one, one where the shear tie is and one where the actual frame is continuous, we get even more complicated analysis, okay? This is actually using not uh, three C quads. This picture that I drew here is two C quads and one C shear element, okay? And this is the same study when we look at a frame. Now we've got a frame with a floor. This is one type of modeling. It's easy to pull the extra, the axial load and moments out of there. That this is the single shear panel between. And then over here is a quad element model. You'll notice in all cases, I went and show the axial load bending and shear at a few spots, corresponding spots on that model but it actually was very challenging for me to calculate. So while I pulled for this first model, the frame model, when it's modeled as a bar, it was very easy to just extract the axial load, shear, and moment at any particular point in the frame. These other ones that just show as axial load, shear, and moment, that didn't come out of the Nastran. What I had to do was take all the forces and uh, in all directions at each and every element, add them together, and sum them up to calculate what's the total axial force, what's the total moment, what's the total shear. It's a lot of work and it's very easy to make a mistake. So, so what do we learn from this modeling technique uh, or from these ideas that we just looked at? What we saw is if we have a, uh, anytime we have like a fuselage frame, like this guy here, usually there will be a floor beam, we can either model our frames as single bar elements, a bunch of bar elements. And usually what we do is say, if we have a stringer, stringers like this, we'd model one bar here, one bar here, one bar there. And then our quads would be our skin. They'd be about like this. You see that? That's what we call a coarse model because there aren't a lot of elements, but it's fairly easy to delump. Now, once again, remember our rod forces we, if we want to know what the rod forces are at the frame, we're going to have to take 
what is reported is a C in the C rod element, and we're going to have to add in whatever comes out of our C shear or our C quad element in order to get the forces at the endpoints. Okay. Now the beauty is if we had used a C shear element, you'll notice that for every, each and every frame we just have caps like this. We're going to just get a running load like that 500 pounds per inch. So let's say we want to analyze that. Uh, the stress in that panel. That would just be 500 over the thickness, right? That's the shear stress. And if we want to go and find out whether that buckles under shear, that's very easy to do because we can then go and use a flat panel of the given dimensions and go look at the techniques we learned in arrow 3271, calculate the critical shear buckling allowable for that panel load and shear, compare it to the stress in that panel, and it's very easy to write a margin of safety. We also can take these rod forces. Now you have to adjust them because if you want the rod force at this end or at this end, you're going to have to take the rod force and add or subtract this force from the shear panel. And then you've got a force you can then go and just do a P over A kind of stress in the stringer, compression or tension. You see how that's nice and simple? However, if we had just modeled this thing with a single bar, as this frame was a single bar, it's relatively easy to just then go and pull our end forces out of that bar. Enjoy. That's all I have for you. Go ahead and uh, play with some of these ideas as you do your modeling. You want to think about if you use a higher mo element, uh, more elements, you're going to get more output. And that more output can be very challenging to deal with. Okay? Enjoy.